God is still in control. He's still in control. This is his love. This is his love for us. He loves us. Hallelujah. Now, uh, the pastors, they, they don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm just following God's obedience. He asked me to do this. He told me to take the elders and pray with these two brothers. These are leaders. These are pastors. And when Moses went up on the mountain, upon Mount Zion, and he met with God, and when he came down, the glory, the glory, the glory, and let the glory be upon them. Let it be over them. Let it be over them in their household. And no weapon form against them shall prosper. Can't nothing touch them in their household. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Your word, my word that I have placed inside of you, it will go deep, deep. A new lever, a new lever, a new lever. A knowledge and understanding I will give unto you. It began to manifest today in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I thank you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 For your glory, Lord. Listen to what we just got through saying. For your glory, your presence, your blessing, for your glory, I will do what? To have your presence, to have your love, I will do anything. And so God, right now, we just, as we listen to this words that we actually sung ourselves, one of the lyrics I heard kind of share God's heart and that he this is what I heard that God gets pleasure from the finished product God gets pleasure from the finished product and so we're, we're going to be talking about something uh, today that kind of goes in line with what God sees and gets pleasure from and so Pastor and I, we've committed for the rest of the year to take us to the next level. Everybody say next level. Next level every time we speak for the rest of the year, for 52 weeks, we'll be going to the next level in some area of our, in our spiritual walk. And so today, Pastor and I decided to start what we call Love Month together. And so what we're going to do, Pastor, today is, well, this was what my desire is. My desire is to discuss with you today next level love. Next level love. And it sounds, it sounds so cliche, doesn't it? Oh, we're going to be talking about next level love. But this is what the, what the Holy Spirit gave me. He said, Pastor, you maturity, Pastor, my desire is for you as you, you operate in your role is to teach love from a biblical perspective. And, and I really want to do that this morning as we, and what we're going to do is this, we're going to take a biblical trip through history, through the Bible to understand what is love supposed to truly look like? What is it supposed to look like? And so before we do that, I want to ask you to do, do something kind of, kind of different. And that is, I want to give a standing ovation. I want you to stand and I want you to celebrate. You know what I want you to celebrate? I want you to celebrate you. Come on. Last week, you all hosted in a mighty. Come on. You can applaud yourself better than that. We showed up and we showed out for our guests. You can go ahead and have a seat. We had a wonderful experience last week. From what we understand, we had um, probably double our membership here last week. And probably a little bit more than double that what we usually see on a, at a Sunday service. 
And so it was a mighty experience last week, but it was a downside for me. I remember, Pastor, the last few things we said to each other was, this is our last time doing the tag team. Man, I'm standing up here now, and I'm like, I miss that dude. I miss that dude. I, I, you know, he always sat to my left, and I'm always like, and so while I preach today, just ignore if you see me do like this. Because it kind of became a habit. I just want to tell you, man, brother, I love you. I love preaching with you, man. Uh, next level for us. So we're going to go ahead and continue today. We're going to focus on, uh, this is love month, so we're going to talk about that next level love. But this is what I want you to do. Remember, for the last five weeks, we've been challenging us to, number one, focus on your focus, right? We're telling you to not only create a focus mentality, but also to sustain your focus. It's not just doing it for that Sunday or the next Sunday. It is, this is who we become over time, right? So we're sustaining our focus. And so we're going to need, again, as we look at sustaining our focus, we're going to also continue. We're elevating what? With a what? Purpose. We're elevating with a purpose. So if we're talking about next level love, we're seeking to love at a different level purposefully. So that's what we're going to be doing. And so I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take you all to uh, one of our uh, elder meetings. You all want to go to an elder meeting? Anybody, anybody ever been to an elder meeting before? Just watch them meet. I'm glad no one raised their hand because I want to take you into a meeting for the first time. And typically what our elders do, first of all, I want to let you know your elders are myself, Pastor Rod, Pastor, Pastor I'm sorry, Elder Vic, Elder Elliot, and of course, Elder Lou. And so we are your elders. So this is what our meetings look like. Y'all ready to go into a meeting? I want to take you there. We're actually, we, we go to a restaurant, and you know this, Elder E. We go into a restaurant, and what we find in our experience, I'm about to say something about uh, our, one, our lead elder, and he didn't know he was going to be in the sermon. And I, I wish Dottie were here to hear this, but hopefully you're online listening to this. But this is what it looks like in an elder meeting. We go and we go to a restaurant. Nothing fancy because we're not that type of group. But we go into a restaurant, and the server comes. They take our drink order, they leave, and, and tell me if I'm wrong now. And, the, and, and when they come back and take our orders, you can see it like this. I'll say, I'll have the shrimp this. And Elder Elliot will say, I'll have the fish that. And then it goes to Elder Lou, and he says, I'll have the, the pasta. And then, of course, it goes around the table. And finally, it gets to Elder Vic. And this is what he does. I want you to see exactly. Tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if I'm telling the truth. This is what he does. He says, I'll have the chicken X. He, and then the person says, thank you very much. They start walking away. And Elder Vic says, uh-uh, uh, come back. Tell me if I'm wrong. He does his every meaning. Am I right? He says, I need to place an order for my wife. Every elder meeting, he's taking an order for his wife. Let me tell you what I don't see. I never see his phone ring and he's taking an order for his wife. She's not saying, I need you to pick something up for me. I don't see that. What I see is that he's programmed himself to make sure she has what she needs when he leaves the restaurant. He's doing that based on what I think, you know, this is what I'm perceiving, is you're doing that because you care to make sure she has what she needs. And he always gets something better than him, right? He'll say, I have the chicken pasta, and then he'll say, she'll have the steak tartare, <laughs> and make sure you throw in a cheesecake with the strawberries. He makes sure that she has what she needs when all he had to do is sit there and take what he wanted. He makes sure the server knows before I leave here, I got to care for someone else because she's on my mind. Elder Vic, I'm going to put you on front street, and I'm going to take a, a shot at this and just guess. I think you love your wife. I do. And your actions show it. Let us pray. Our Father God, we're grateful. We're thankful for you teaching us what love really is. And God, this is a tough one. This is a tough one because your prescription for love, for love looks different than ours. And so, God, we, we ask you right now that as your word teaches us, you even said yourself that those who have ears, let them hear. 
You're asking those who have ears to listen and hear what you have to say. So as we prayed together this morning, you and I in our long time this morning, you gave me that scripture and you said this, let them know if only they're willing to hear. This can be a life-changing experience. So God, I ask that you to open their ears, open their hearts, and open their minds as you prepare to teach us what next level love looks like. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I need you all to do me a favor. I want you to just look around. There might be somebody in your family. You don't have to be a stranger. Just look around and, and look someone in the eyes and just say this. I love you. Anybody? Now, come on, come on. Turn around. I, I had, oh, oh, I saw a kiss. I saw two kisses. It's getting serious in here. We're, we're saying, I love you. I love you. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever said, I love you to someone, and their response is, love you too? It's a difference, isn't it? You're sitting there, and your heart is filled, and you look them in the eye, and you say, you know what? I love you. And the response is, love you too. Doesn't feel the same, does it? So we're looking at the opportunity, Des, to say, I love you in the way that God, hallelujah, I love my wife. I love you. So we're going to go back to last week, in the last five weeks, and we're going to kind of build a bridge. We're going to build a bridge because Pastor and I have been, been very specific in what we wanted you to take away, and hopefully you've taken away some things. And so what we're going to do is going to go back, because this is what I remember from the last message. From the last message, we asked the question, right, what could have prevented Joseph from completing his purpose? Remember we asked that question last week? We asked who would do that. Who, what was the answer? Pastor said it best. Joseph. If Joseph decided not to, it could have led to it could have led to an issue. Also, we asked the question, as we were asking the question, how could Joseph have done that? We said that one of the things that could have occurred in Joseph's life, Joseph could have become apathetic. Remember, we talked about this. Apathy. We're talking about being apathetic. And so when you talk about someone who's apathetic, that is someone who's decided they, they don't have interest, right? Right? Listen, they don't have feeling, and they don't have concern. You're talking about someone who's apathetic. So you can think of some things in your life where you've created an apathy for it, where you just simply, you don't have feeling for it. I don't feel like it. This is not something I feel like doing. I don't have the feeling or emotion to get me there. I don't have the interest to do it. And I'm really not concerned about it, right? So if Joseph, pastor, would have become apathetic, Instead of him focusing on saving many lives, he could have went on his, on his own, doing his own business, right? He could have done that. He could have done that. So let me just tell you what I think, what I discovered in my prayer time and my study, is that true love defeats apathy. True love, look at this, where you don't care, you're not concerned, you're not feeling it, you're just not, but you have love on the other side, that's all you think about. You see the difference? So we're talking about killing apathy. So what we're going to do is, I think we found the elixir or the medication to deal with apathy when it comes to our spirits to walk. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about love today because our desire is what? To bring people in, equip them, and send them out. So they can what? Many lives. Save many lives. And so our desire is to create a clear picture. And this is what, and when I say we, this is myself and the Holy Spirit today, our desire is to create a clear photo. This is what our desire is, is to create a clear photo of what next level love looks like based on what the Bible teaches us. And I know in culture, in society, we, we've been taught love in different ways, right? And so as we teach today, this is what I want you to do. We've got to define and understand what is biblical love? What is, what is love? What is this thing we're saying here? I see it in movies. I see it in, in relationships. I think... We're looking at what is true love based on what the Bible says. And my, my mission today is possibly to change the way you think. And so this is what I need you to do. And it's going to be pretty difficult. What I need you to do is I need you to clear out your memories, right? I want you to take your, your memory, 
your memory and your, and your CPU, I don't know if they still call it that, but I want you to wipe it out. Everything you think you know about love. Can we do that? If we could just try to do that. So right now, I just want, I want you to close your eyes and say, all right, I'm wiping out everything. I don't want to remember anything that I thought I knew about love because we're going to go through the scripture and define contextually. We're going to use the whole Bible in context, not one verse here, and just talk about that verse. We're going to take the whole Bible, so I'm going to have to read some scripture today. Is that, is that okay? Y'all don't mind coming to church and hearing the Bible, do you? So I'm going, to t- I'm going to read some scripture today, and hopefully by the end, there will be a total understanding of what true love is from God's perspective. So I want you to repeat after me. I am God's representative. I am the example. Did you hear what you just said? And you're going to hear that as we teach later on today. So it's your responsibility. I want you to open up your mind's Bible because today you won't need to look at the Bible until I start reading these scriptures. You're going to say, well, Pastor, why are you saying I don't need the Bible? I'm at church. Because today's foundational scripture is very familiar to kids from, from here to here. It's probably the most popular scripture that you've ever heard in society. If I were to ask the congregation, what is the most popular scripture that everyone knows? What is it? (laughs) John 3.16. We're going to look at that today. We're going to use it as a foundation. We're going to use John 3.16 as a foundation. We're going to go all through the Bible. So this is what I'm going to do. I want you to open your Bibles. I don't want you to pull it up. I want to see how good we are. Okay, you ready? Four sections. When I say stop, you stop and the next session continues. Y'all ready? Starting on this side. Are y'all ready? One, two, three. Loud as you can. Stop. Stop. Did y'all see that? Everybody give yourselves a hand. The most popular scripture. Let me read it to you one more time for those online. It says, for God so loved the world that he, what? Gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. This is a scripture we hear it all the time. But this is what we're going to do today. We're going to dissect that thing. And we're going to use the scripture to to support it. And so if you look at your Bible, this is going to be interesting. If you look at like the, the ESV version of the scripture or the ESV version, ES version of the scripture. I say a version twice. And so if you look at the ESV scripture, the way it's written, if, if you look at and go through it, it'll have the word love mentioned 684 times. That means that it meant something to the, to the author who wrote it, right? 684 times. But I'm going to tell you something that's, that's kind of interesting. The King James Version only has it in there 442 times. Hmm. Love is mentioned 684 times in the ESV, 442 in the King James. That's a lot of, that's a large difference in number, isn't it? You got about 240 times that's missing, the word love is missing from the King James Version. Something just isn't right. Or is it? So let's go look at the scripture. We're going to look at it. We're going to ask why is there a difference. But first, we've got to look at the word, of course, love in the Greek. Pastor, you did a great job teaching this last year, I believe. We talked about the word that is in the Greek in the New Testament is what? Agape. So you're looking at agape. If you wanted to define it simply, it is God-like love. It's the way God loves, right? So we're looking at agape. If you look at the word love and you define it, it's unconditional. It's, it's unconditional. What does that mean, Pastor? That means I don't care what you do, I'm still going to do it. God love, God's love does it regardless of what we do. Are y'all tracking with me? If you look at this agape love, it is not based on the goodness of the person who's being loved. It has nothing to do with that. It's, it has nothing to do with that. It's doing something, right? It has a posture of doing something regardless of who's receiving it. So agape love looks like that, but it's also, it has a benevolent feature to it. Remember that word again? Benevolence means it is done because I care, because I see a need. God says, you need my love, I care. So therefore, regardless of what you did last night, you know what you did. I love you. Isn't that a, isn't that a wonderful God? 
His love is agape. It's not, it's not attached to who we are, what we do. It, but let me tell you the difference. The reason the ESV has 684 and the King James has 442 is because, listen to this, the King James version of the scripture actually replaces the word love with another word. If you put the King James version and stand it, put it next to ESV, it's going to be a different word. Love, charity. Love, charity. Love replaced with charity. And so there's a difference in the number you see love because it's replaced because he wants us to give an, get an idea of what love's supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like charity. So let's look at the word the definition. Let's look at the, word def, the definition of the word charity. And this is what it says. It says, something given to someone in need in, accompanied by a benevolent feeling. There's that word again, Pastor. We're loving or we're giving charity because what? We're giving to someone because we see they need it. And it's accompanied by the fact that I'm doing it because I care. We're talking about charity. So that word has been in the scripture replacing love over 200 times. So it looks like something different now, doesn't it? We're sh- and I love your shirt, by the way. You got the love shirt on this morning. So we're shifting. You want to come do the message? Okay. So you have an opportunity here to see that we're replacing the word love with charity. That means you're what? Giving something, right? I love you. I'm giving love to you. We're talking about that next level of love, but we're talking about give. Pastor, you said give. I want to give you a clearer picture of what that word means. We're going to go through the scripture. I promise you this is going to be great. And so the word give is defined as this. And I want you to hear some of the key words. Close your eyes and listen to the key words. When you're talking about charity, you're talking about giving. It is, listen, freely transfer the possession of something to someone. What's the key word you heard? Freely. Nobody forces you to give charity. You freely decide to what? Give. But then the definitions continue. says to present voluntarily. Oops, there's that word again. And without expectation of compensation. I'm just, just going to teach the Bible, I promise. That's all I'm going to do. Because today before we leave, my desire is for me to reshape your heart and your mind, right? So when you say I'm going to love people, it looks a certain way. So the third def- definition I have the word give is to care about something to the value or extent of. So I, I, it's, it's immeasurable. I care about you so much that I will freely and voluntarily give you something not expecting anything back. I'm giving you something. And so I'm going to give you one more definition, and and it's going to be very brief, because this is going to come up, I promise you. I'm going to give you a definition of the word have. Remember, we've given. Now I want you to what? Have it. And so if you look at the word have, it means this, to possess, to receive, or obtain. That means me, the giver of love, I have now handed over something to you, and you now what? Possess it. I no longer have it. It now belongs to you. You see my definition? You see what charity looks like? And so I'm going to ask you to think about this question. This is so important because this question needs to be reverberating through your mind, through the whole sermon. Can we do that? I want you to keep thinking about this question. And the question is, I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I loving others the way God requires me to love? Listen to what I said. Am I action word, loving, I-N-G, others the way who? God, what? Requires me to do so. Oh, my God. I'm going to put a warning on this one. You know, you put a warning on things. This is maybe, I'm going to warn you. This may be tough for some people. Let me just say this. The teaching may be tough for you because you, and let me just reassure you, you won't be the first person who's a little bit shaken when love is discussed from God's reality. So I want you to just stay with me if you can. And so we're going to the next level of love. Can I teach today? 
I just really want to do that. But I'm going to step back. I'm not going to be the teacher today. I'm going to let the word just teach you. Because it says here, for God so loved the word that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, they should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we're going back to John chapter 3. Let me tell you the story. I, I'm not going to read it to you. I'm going to start at John chapter 3, verse 1. And can I tell you what's going on? You have this Pharisee whose name is Nicodemus. And the scripture says that Jesus is at home chilling. Can I bring you to 2023? Right. He's chilling in the house, listening to some old jazz. Jesus got kicked back. You know, he's looking at scripture, looking at the scrolls. Gets a knock on the door late at night. And Nicodemus, he opens the door. And Nicodemus is standing there. This Pharisee is by himself. Nicodemus is looking around like, can I come in? Because he couldn't be seen with Jesus, right? He couldn't be seen with Jesus. So it, he's making a late night come through, right? He's dropping through late at night, and he comes in, and he comes in, he's, he's asking, he says this, he says, Nicodemus says to Jesus, man, I've been hearing what you're preaching, I've seen what you've done, bro. The stuff you saying, it can't come from anywhere else but from God. This is what he's saying, Nicodemus is saying this to Jesus. Jesus doesn't even waste any time, right? He didn't say, well, thank you, bro, you know what I'm saying, you know, I just write, I, remember I wrote that all night. He didn't say that. He goes right into teaching. Jesus says to Nicodemus, he says, if you're not born again, you will never see my father. As he starts teaching, right? And so Nicodemus, and I, I guess I would ask the same question. He said, wait a minute. How can someone be born twice from a mo their mother? And Jesus says this, unless you're born of the water and you're born of the what? Spirit, you cannot see my father and spend eternity with him. Nicodemus is like, whoa. Now I'm starting to get it. He's telling him, and some people you hear born again. Can I kind of share what born again mean? Right? You had an old spirit, right? You confess with your heart and your mouth that you desire to have a relationship with Christ forever. The Holy Spirit then what? Comes in, and then there's a communion between you two. So you are no longer the old spirit. You're now being consumed by a... So you're what? Born again. Simple, isn't it? I heard that all my life. I was like, Lord, what does that mean? So you're born again spiritually. So Jesus explained to Nicodemus that this has to occur for you to spend eternity with his father. But then he goes on. He says, and my father sent me to make sure that you understand this. The desire is not to cause you any harm. What he's saying is I came to do to make sure not to give you harm, but to save your soul. That's what I'm here for. That's verse 15. Then he goes on to verse 16. He says what? For. Right after he says that part about I came here to not to, to, to do these things. I came here to, for salvation. I'm here for salvation. I'm here to make sure your spirit communes with his forever. Then he says what? For what? God so loved the world that he what? His only begotten son, so that whoever believes him shall what? But have everlasting life. They will not perish. They will not perish. They will not live in eternity without him. They will not perish. They will not be separated from him. They will always have a relationship with him. They will have. I gave so that they can have. I will sacrifice so that they can I will give so they can have. You see the picture? We're talking about true love. We're talking about this. So, Pastor, you said you promised us. You promised us you're going to go through the scripture. Now it's time for you to get your computers ready and your paper pages ready. Are you ready to go through the scripture? Because we got to marry the whole thing together. I can't just give you a verse. I got to take the whole picture and paint it with all the colors that God gave me. So we're going to start off and look at the scripture because we got to start off with the original communication with the people of God. So you remember what's going on in Leviticus. What's going on in Leviticus? Moses has, has received the what? The law. So in Leviticus, if you study it, this is everything God wanted Israel to know about his heart. These are the things he's saying, don't do this because it's against my heart. Do this because it's, 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 it's for me. I want you to do this. So if you look at Leviticus chapter 19. Verse 17, 
I'm going to read this to you. Listen to what he says. This is the law he's, fi- he's giving to, to Moses. Moses is reporting the law to his, who? God's chosen people. Moses has to make sure that God's people understand what he wants for them. Are y'all tracking with Leviticus? So in chapter 19, verse 17, it says this. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor. That means you're going to have some disagreements. I can see that. But not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge. Anybody say any grudge against the children of your people. This is what it says next. But you shall love your neighbor. Everybody say love as yourself. Now listen to what he does here in Leviticus chapter 19. He says, you shall love your neighbor just neighbor, just like you love yourself. My, 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 pastor, you're already starting off difficult. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. But look what he says next. I am the Lord. In other words, this is what I tell my kids. I tell you to clean your room. I am your father. Listen to what he's doing here. He's telling you, love your neighbor like you love yourself. I'm your father. Hear my words. Then he goes on. He didn't want to stop there. He says, you shall keep my statutes. Remember, this is a note from God through Moses to the children who he selected to be his own. This is true. The scripture. So you see this picture being set up in Leviticus. So that's your Old Testament example. But then we're going to go through history. And remember, God is laying down the law. He's giving them the law. And, and, and he's doing this as we in, in a time frame where it is setting the foundations of allowing us to know God's heart. But now let's go to another level. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 5. And all these are familiar scriptures, but we got to marry all of them together. Because if you notice, they're gonna, if I, as I read, they're going to keep tracking going from one to the next. One author is going to give to the next author, to the next speaker from the last conversation. This is just a Bible because context means this. We can't study the scripture without understanding how it's lined up together. What has happened over time is we'll take a, a scripture out and live on it, not understand the full context, right? And that can be harmful, right? So, we, so let's, let's go to this, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. This is doing a sermon on the mount. Jesus himself is talking. He's spending three chapters, four long chapters, just teaching now what God's heart is from his perspective. Are y'all tracking with me? If you are, say amen. Verse 43 in chapter 5 says this. You have heard that it is said, listen to what he's about to say, you shall love your neighbor and hate, and hate your enemy. This is what people say. But I say to you, instead, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who, wait a minute, Pastor, hold on. Remember I told you it was going to be tough for some people, right? Let me keep reading what Jesus Christ himself said. He says, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do not uh, do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who, sp- who spitefully use you and persecute you. This is Jesus talking to you. That you may, listen to this great part, verse 45, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. Let me tell you what you're hearing here. If you're able to do these things, people will see you for what you say you are. I told you this might not be as easy as it sounds. This is, we're talking about true, next level love. We're not talking about this stuff, right? Next level love looks like this. Right. So we're going up, but it goes on. Verse 46, it says, for if you love those who love you, what reward is that for you? That's easy. I'm just going to hang out with people who love me. But he's, he's challenging that. But then he goes on to verse 47, saying, if you greet your brethren only, what do you more do than others? Remember, I'm talking to my people. I'm not, this is not for everybody. This message is for who? My people. So for my people, he's saying this, what different are you than someone who never met me if you just do the same thing they do? I'm just telling you what the Bible says. He says, Pastor, just read it to him. Just read it to him. But then this is what he says in verse 48. He says, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. If you can do these things above, then you'll see that you want to be like God. 
<laughs> Isn't that crazy? So if you go back in your history books, right? Listen, listen, listen. If you go back over history, especially with westernized Christianity, and you look at what Christians have done to other people, you ask yourself, why do people not want what we have? I'm just going to tell you what, what, I would, what I would feel about Christianity if I was a Native American, if I was an African, if I were a, an indigenous person from Australia, if I were a person in, in, in eastern and in northern Africa, if I got a chance to see Africans love, I'm sorry, Christians love, I don't want your stuff. In fact, I hate your stuff. If you look at the history, remember, we're going to next level love. In the scripture, because Jesus is going to continue. Go to John chapter 13, verse 34, because we're going through. We're going to tie these scriptures together. Y'all don't mind if we teach a little bit, because I know y'all got to get something to eat. But I've got to teach this. Please let me do this. John chapter 13, verse 34. This is what Jesus is saying. Listen to the first two words, a new commandment. What did he say? Come on, come on, listen to me. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. What's the, what's the word? As. I want you to love as. What does that mean? The same. I want you not, I want you to love your enemies, because he, he's still one message, right? He's still giving you one message. So he said, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to love your neighbors just like you love yourself, just like I love you. No difference. No, 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 no. I, I got to give it to you like this because that's what he told me to do. He said, also love one another, but it says in verse 35. By this, oh my Lord. All will know that you are my disciples. Can I read that again, Tony? Because I know you, we on time, right? But I got to read this again. It says, I'm giving you a new command that you love one another as I love you. And if you do this, that's how everybody know you're mine. See, the thing is, Minister Champagne, he told me that if they only come to hear with those ears, things will change, right? They're not just coming today to say, I went to church. Today you came to hear what he wanted you to know. So can I have your attention just for a few more minutes? Because we got to keep going through the scriptures. He's saying, love, love your enemy. He said, do it like I do. Somebody's saying right now, but I don't want to. He's saying, God, you don't know your people. It's some heathens down here. I'm not just talking about the Christians. Man, I want y'all to see how close these scriptures are together. I just read you John 13. And remember, these are scrolls, right? So it's one scroll, right? It's not multiple scrolls. When I write, when I read from John, it's one scroll. One message from John. So if I'm telling you verse 13, and I go to verse 14, chapter 14, after, after chapter 13, that's right after. John chapter 14, verse 15. Y'all stay with me. Jesus is saying this. If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Oh, come on, pastor. You're not playing fair. Jesus, you're trying to tell me the only way I can. Sh I got to. If you love me, you do what I, but I do love you. I'm going to, I'm going to keep teaching because somebody came to hear, right? So it says verse, that's chapter 14. If you love me, you'll do, you'll keep my commandments. But then he goes to chapter 15, verse 12. This is crazy how it goes from one message right to the next one. Listen, verse chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment. Listen to that, Jesus. First, he tells you, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Then right behind it in the next chapter, he says what? Now, this is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. There he goes again. Greater love has, has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. For you are my friends. If you do whatever I command, that means you're truly my friend if you do what I say. Leviticus said, I am Lord. You'll do, if you do what I say, that means you really love me. 
despite how you feel or how they act. Because remember, it's charity. I'm giving you love despite who you are. Even if you're my enemy, you said something bad about me. I heard you whispering. Shaquisha told me what you had said, and it was bad. You even talked about my family. You talked about my mom. You read the scripture says, love your enemies, even when they do things against you. It said, pray for them. Still, if you do this, it'll prove to everybody that you're truly my disciple. But wait a minute, Pastor. They, on Instagram, they posted a picture of me and body shame me. Love your neighbor despite what they do. Y'all messing up and, and you might be listening today. I hear you. Because we're going to another level. But we got to stay and listen to Jesus because Jesus is talking. Matthew chapter 22. I got to hurry up because y'all like, I'm tired of all these scriptures at church. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 says this. You shall love the Lord with all your what? Soul, mind. This is the what? First and greatest commandment to love him. Y'all saying, I'm safe now because that's all he wants to do is love him. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these commandments, listen to this. On these two commandments, love me and love them, all the things in the scripture revolve around. <laughs> in other words, God is saying this. Y'all loving each other means something to me. Lord, please, you promised me they would listen. So that's why you told me to teach this. But then it goes on. As you notice over and over, Jesus keeps repeating the Old Testament. He keeps repeating Leviticus, right? Because he's saying it's all one message. Thousands of years ago, it's the same message I'm giving you today. Because my father hadn't changed his mind yet. John chapter 17, verse 24. I'm just going to tell you what he said. He said, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave to me may be with me where I am. In other words, when I leave here, my flesh is gone, and I return to you. My desire is that all the ones who will listen will spend eternity with us. This is what he's saying. I'm, are y'all reading the same scripture? Because he goes on to say this. He says, because you loved me before the foundations of the world. Before God said, in the beginning, I will create, he was already loving. God is the creator of love. He's loving his son in the heavenly realm before any, he started doing anything. It was dark. It was without void. There was no water. There was no animals. There was no mountains, no planets, no nothing. And God is loving. And so Jesus is saying this in, in verse 26. It says that he will declare that the love which you love me may be what? In them. But then there's a huge comma. Oh, no, that means something's after that. He says he's, his desire, his last prayer, Pastor, you've taught this so well. His last prayer, he's saying this to his father. I want them to love them, love them, love each other, and that love will be in them. But then he goes on after the comment says, and I in them. Y'all want to take a break? Everybody just breathe. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Because we've been taking this in. Exhale. Because we he's saying, this is this is so, this is his version now. This is love, his version. Okay. When I was growing up, there was a show that came on in the 1970s called Love American Style. Some of you old people remember that? You remember that? You are old. And in this show, 
Oh, Elder E knows it. Not as old as Elder Vic, but he's old. But he's actually, it's a show about learning how, we, how to love American style. So in, in shows like this, since the 70s, we've been learning how to do it like they want us to do it. And he's saying, that's not, that's not, that's not it. Remember, you say peace and love. At the same time, getting high, right? Jesus, like, wait a minute, what, what's going on here? This is not what I designed, right? Let me keep going because I see, you're right, you, I saw her hit a watch like this. So you, you ask yourself, am I loving others the way God requires me to love? You haven't forgot the question, have you? Because God says, somebody's going to hear what I say today. And it's not going to be easy. But then Paul comes in. Paul said, Jesus, can I take over? Can I tell him what I, what I got from you? Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. And while we were sinners, he died for us. He gave so we could have. You're talking about next level love. Paul says, can I go to uh, the same scroll, chapter 12, verse 9? He says, Bless those who persecute you. God dog it, Paul, you start with that stuff again. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be the same, be the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate it with humility. Wait a minute. So what you tell me, Paul, is the person who is able to symbolize and objectify or show us personified love is a person who's humble. Let me tell you something. Making sure nobody can hear our conversation. The reason you might struggle loving people shh, is because you're not humble enough to do it. High-minded people struggle with loving others. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. Notice when you're not you're struggling with loving other people, how high you feel. Right? If somebody's done this before, say amen. That was back in the old days. Come on. You see what I'm saying? When you struggle to reach down and love somebody else, it's because you're too high to reach down that far. Paul's saying you can love this way when you become humble. Come on, come on. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Because Paul, Paul teaching us, and he wants us to hear, because he goes on to Romans chapter, remember it's right after uh, chapter 12. He went to chapter 13, same scroll. Chapter 13, verse 8. He says, owe no one nothing except what? To love one another. For he who loves one another fulfills the commandment. The law. I'm going to keep going. For the, for the commandments say you shall not commit adultery. He goes on, no murder, no none of that stuff. It says, but you should love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. See, all that stuff that was given in Leviticus was simply to tell y'all love each other. Right? Don't do this because if you do that, that's going to mean if you, if you commit adultery, that shows you don't love. Definitely if you murder somebody, you didn't love them. So therefore, I'm telling you, don't do those things because my desire is for you all to love each other. Are we putting the scripture together yet? Because we're still asking the question, are we loving each other like God wants us to? But then Paul later on writes another letter. He's writing to the bad church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians. You know, he's dogging them out. And he says some things. He describes love to us. He says in chapter 13, verse 4, he said, love suffers and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Duh, love is not puffed up. Love is not rudely. Love, love does not speak its own. It's not provoked. It's not, it, think, it does not think evil. does not rejoice in someone else's struggles. Does not re it rejoices in the truth. It hears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Lord, let me, help me teach this, please, Lord. But then he goes on. He says, watch, stand fast, in the stand fast in faith. Be brave, be strong. Let all you do. How much? 
please, Lord, let them hear this call. Let all that you do be done in love. Everything. 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 Believers, the way you prove you with you me and that you have me in you is that in everything you do, you're purposely focused on next level love. This is this is exciting. Right? So we looked at the scripture again. Am I loving others the way God requires me to love? John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he, his only begotten son, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but they shall have. I'm giving to them my son who will sacrifice his flesh to make sure they have. I want them to have. I want them to have. Thus. So I'm going to give you five ways to know. That you're loving others the way God wants you to. It's going to be so quick. I'm just going to read them basically. Because I'm trying to help us, okay? God is saying, we're so, you guys, remember this, he said this in Matthew. He says that my desire is for them to identify themselves and understand that they are the salt and the light on earth. I chose them to be the salt and the light. I selected them individually. Woke them up on a Sunday morning and said, now it's time for us to get married. We're going to get married so you can be the light and the salt. And the way they will know, Tony, that you're the light and the salt is how you love. I'm just telling the truth. Let me tell you something, Pastor. I had to do this first by myself. Hanging my head in shame. Thinking about the times I fell short of the glory of God. For your glory, I'll do anything. That's what y'all song. Number one. These are ways to know that you are loving others the way God requires you to love them. To love them. You ready? Number one. You have a benevolent heart. What are you saying, Pastor? The first thing we have to do is look at ourselves and say, do I really care? Do I care enough to provide a charity, which is love? Do I care? And again, that, remember we're fighting against apathy. A person who's apathetic doesn't even care. I don't have no feelings about it. I have no interest in it. I'm just indifferent about it. The person who's listening today, who's hearing is saying, I'm, I'm troubled by this. Because now my benevolent heart has been, it's been tugged on. So therefore, since it's been tugged on, I now care about doing better. So the person who wants to love the way God has wrote it in his prescription says, I care enough to give so they can have. That's number one. Number two, you not only have an obedient heart, a benevolent heart, but you have an obedient heart. This is tough for some people. Remember this, Paul said, an humble person can hear this. But the puffed up person, he used that term, I didn't. The puffed up heart can't even hear this. And so what am I saying? God gave it to Moses. He said, listen. Jesus gave it to the world. He said, listen. Paul repeated it. He said, listen. Even the apostle John wrote about it, and pastor's going to kill it next week about love he gave it to him but some people still refuse to hear it you disobedient child is what he's saying i am your lord but you still won't listen because you're so puffed up and you don't care that you refuse to love people i've assigned to you all because they're not perfect to you do you notice how much, I, how much I've seen you do? <laughs> you know, it's one of the scariest things I live with. Is that God has seen everything I've done. 
My wife hadn't seen it. Some of you hadn't seen it. Solomon hadn't seen it. My daddy hadn't seen it. Mommy didn't see it. But God has seen the stuff that nobody else has seen. But he still loves me. And we got nerve to turn our back on people because of what they said. My, my. I'm ready to go, too. I see you. You're right. You're right. You're right. How long I got? Because he told me to teach this. I'm going to do that. So you got to have a benevolent heart that cares, an obedient heart that will listen, who will listen to the scriptures and do what he says. They want to please him. You say you'll do anything for his glory. I'm talking about that person. You know his heart and his desire, and you want to mirror it, right? That's that person. That's the obedient person. The third thing you got to do is you got to have a charitable heart. A charitable heart wants to do what? The opposite of give is take. In America, because we're capitalistic, we're greedy, we're selfish, we were founded as a country on taking stuff. Call me a lie to my face. America's taking everything it's got. So why shouldn't its inhabitants not be takers? Remember, since the beginning of the new America, This place wasn't discovered. It was taken and, and, and rebranded. So ever since the beginning of time, we've been taught over and over, take what you want, take what you want, take what you want. Take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. How do we create a charitable posture when all we've done is take? Right? When we were little kids, remember the way all we did is lay in bed the night before, try our best to stay awake. So the next morning, we knew we were going to what? Receive. Right? How many of y'all stayed up late at night saying, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. Lord, Lord, I can't go to sleep because I want to give. Raise your hand if that was you. I just want you to know online that one person raised their hand, and we're going to meet after service. But we were raised up from children to want to receive. So why do you think you struggle with giving love? Please, Lord, you said this morning to me when I was in that room, you said, if they only have ears to hear, this will change everything. Because Pastor and I want to take you to the next level. It's my temple time is. I don't have a watch on. So the fourth thing is, is this. You remember, you have to be charitable, you have to be benevolent, you got to be obedient, but you also have to love regardless. This is what you heard in the scripture. There's nothing that can stop you from loving when you have a benevolent, charitable heart, an obedient heart. There's nothing they can do. Now, do I still want to kick it with you all the time? Maybe not. Are you coming to my house and I'm making you cornbread and greens? Maybe not. But I'm going to love you and I'm going to pray that God continues to become more of him inside of you. Because you're hurting people. And the desire of God is for you to love people. So my desire in my prayer time is, Lord, continue to fill them with your Holy Spirit. Because if that happens, then you're glorified. Somebody say hallelujah if you're worship. So I'm going to do the last one because I know it's getting kind of hot in here. Please, Lord, let them hear this. Lord, this could change things because we're going to the next level of love. Number five, you love regardless. You got a charitable heart, an obedient heart, a benevolent heart. But the fifth thing you got to do is this. You have to be willing to sacrifice yourself. Because the scripture told us this. We're supposed to be mirror images of Christ. Jesus came here on day one, episode one, knowing from the beginning that he would have to lose his own life for others. So if the spirit of God is in you, 
and he lives in you, you should have a mindset that says, you might today come before my needs. Oh, my. I know y'all didn't like that one. Because that's not how I was raised. I'm to preserve me. Right? I'm supposed to make me happy. Message number three in this series, February 3rd, Sunday, February. Entitled Me. I've been actually taught to preserve me. Not to let harm come to me. Not to let my emotions be hurt. So therefore, I can't sacrifice for them. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is the greatest of the commands. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But I don't want to, Lord. That means I'm going to have to leave home today and not lay on the sofa. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That means I have to go to church today and hug on people. I don't want to do that today. I don't even like them. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. That way they'll know you're mine. You need to be out there doing this because people need to see more like me. But I'm an introvert, Lord. That's not how I designed you. You made that decision. My desire is for you to step out there and be the light. But I'm just going to tell it like I got it. I'm going to go ahead and finish now because I know y'all saying, he, t- he said several times he's going to stop talking. The question was, what is love? We discovered the five things that kind of define if we're loving people the way God has asked us to do that. Because the goal was to defeat apathy. Apathetic Christians might as well be everybody else. So for us to embrace love, we defeat apathy. Right? I'm loving you so much that I will then stand up to make sure you have because I gave. Because Jesus Christ came to earth and said this, I will sacrifice myself to make sure you have hope. Wait, I will give so you will have hope. I will give so you will have peace. I will give so you will have trust. I will give so you will have strength. I will give so you can have authority. I will give so you will have love. I will give so that you will have. Let us stand to our feet. Hallelujah. I bless your name, Lord, because you were were crystal clear with this one. Lord, let them be hearers. Let them be hearers. Praise your name. Praise your name. I'm done. I'm done. I've talked a long time. And y'all want you to forgive me, but I have to be obedient. Okay? I, I, I apologize. tell you what happened in the scripture in Matthew no, I'm sorry John chapter 6 Jesus started talking this love stuff my flesh my blood my blood my flesh love love despite your enemies he's going around preaching this stuff it says in John chapter 6 that several disciples decided this ain't for me you remember that After the teachings of Jesus Christ, he's healing, he's showing his power. They said, but all this stuff, you're talking about love and sacrifice. and You know what? I prefer just to be a a Jew and work by the law, not this new covenant. All I want to do is go to the temple and leave my stuff. I prefer not to be a follower anymore because this is too hard for me. question is, are are you able to accept what he wants and humble yourself enough to for the rest of your life? Remember, we cleared our memory banks. So we start off fresh today, right? So for the rest of your life, can you commit to seeking to love the way he desires us to love? That means it's going to take some sacrifice, guys. Because we've been taught, even during COVID, to be home and be alone. Not to touch it. No, I don't want want to go be around people. I don't like people like that. We've been programmed. Now it's time to be reprogrammed to where you're simply looking for ways to show love. 
because that's the greatest thing we can do besides loving God himself. And even doing it, it proves how much we love him. That's what the scripture says. So I want you to do it. I'm not going to ask for anyone to do anything, but this is what I'm going to do. Can I just pray that there's next level love coming from this group? Can we do that online? Can we ask God to fill us with his spirit as we are born again spiritually that it really looks that way because of the way we love others? Right? Let's pray together. Now, Father God, I'm grateful. You did it. You gave me what you gave me, and I appreciate you, and I, I, I got to tell you, you got me with this one. But you, you only arrested my heart, God, to look more like yours. And so I'm grateful for that, God. And this is my desire, that today those with ears came to hear. And that as they heard, God, their heart will change and that there will be a spirit of humility that overtakes any spirit of puffed up haughtiness, stiff neckness. That they will come so low that they can walk out what you've called them to do. And God, right now, I know somebody's struggling with this. They, they may leave here and still be the same arrogant person they were when they walked in. But I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to pray that their hearts will change. That there will be such a spirit of humility that overtakes years and years of being puffed up and arrogant. They can now be low enough because you're so high that they can submit their love to others. Your word says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, that it's hard for us to, to submit to each other until we can submit to you. So I'm asking you, Lord, that we have total and complete submission first to you. Your word says the greatest commandment is to love you. So God, we need to love you first and submit to you so we can love others. So God, we're praying for a strong step one today and that's to love you with all our hearts, our souls, our hearts, and our, and our minds. And so God, I say I'm grateful. I love you so much. And Lord, allow me to show that love to others as well as my friends here who are listening that there's a new love on the streets that looks just like you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to do this. Um, I'm going to ask Pastor to come up uh, just for a second. Also. I want to talk about, I want him to talk about us. You can have your seats. Just, if you can, Pastor, just share your heart. Wasn't that an awesome word today? Praise God. Thank you, Pastor, for your obedience. We needed that. We needed that. I just wanted to continue the conversation of love. And I want to just thank our missionaries that actually came out yesterday. And we demonstrated love to our community. So thank you. If you were with us yesterday, just raise your hand. Let's celebrate those. We had a really, really nice turnout. We had a church service. Can I just be, am I, am I, we had a church service after we had the opportunity to share the love that Pastor talked about today. We had a church service and God really moved amongst us. And so I'm excited and I want to just for just a moment, Sister Lynette, I want you to stand up. And we want to celebrate our fearless mission leader as she's preparing to transition to her next level. Because something God shared with me this morning that exhibits in you, and that's a willingness and an obedience. Pastor talked about being obedient. And so it's tough to be willing when your body is hurting. And sometimes willingness means that we do things that we don't really feel like doing. That's the love that you talked about. So, Sister Lynette, we want to just say thank you for your, your leadership and leading a team of missionaries that got a chance to do what we've said we would do is exalt God, edify one another, and equip each other so that we could spread the gospel. We're literally, I'm watching Todd pray for someone. She's weeping. She's weeping as he's praying for her. And, and, and we see just weights being lifted off of her. When we can share our love, others can, can be blessed. So I just want to admonish our people, as Pastor mentioned today, that we do have an assignment that 
that basically signifies us sharing our love with others. And so we want to thank you because she's preparing to leave. And I'm just going to ask you just over the next couple of weeks as God lays it on your heart to be a blessing to Sister Lynette. She's moving. She may have expenses or however God lays on your heart to be a blessing to her. We, but we want to say thank you for your leadership and your willingness and obedience. There were times you showed up when you didn't feel like it. There were times there were pain, pain in your body and you still showed up and you obeyed God. So we thank God for you and we just want to say thank you. Amen. Amen. Let's do this real quick. As we talked about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you know that in the scripture, it teaches us that that should, and I love the way he said this, that communion is a way to remind you of what all this is about, right? It's about love. It's about sacrifice. It's about putting others first. Just remember what I came for. And it says in the scripture that in this communion, he was with his friends for three years. These were his, his aces, his boys. They were together for three years and sat down and had supper with them. And after the supper, he, he, he came together and said, I got to talk to you guys. He says, brothers, this is, this is it. This is the last night. Remember all the stuff I've been talking about for three years? It's coming tomorrow. And with that coming, of, coming tomorrow, I'm leaving you. It's going to be it's going to be bad. It's going to be exactly what the scriptures foretold. I will be slain. I will be a sacrifice like the sheep and lamb on the altar. I will I'm leaving. It's going to be painful. It's going to be blood. It's going to be a bloody mess. And I'm leaving you. He said this. What I'm about to do is is something that you should never forget to do to remind you of the whole story. Right? So this is what we're going to do. It says in scripture, let's do this together. He says he took a bread and he broke it. And he blessed it. And I can see him raising it up and blessing it. And I can see him thinking in his heart, well, it's all over. This is what I came for. Since the beginning of time, before there was anything created, I knew this day would come. I know I'm doing it for his glory. So I'll do anything. At the same time, I'm doing this because I love them. So he told his disciples, he says, as he blessed it, Let's eat together to remember the body that will be sacrificed. Let us do that to never forget his sacrifice. Then, of course, in Scripture, I can see in that time where it may have been a clay jar. It may have been a goblet. It may have been something that just held the, this wine that was in it. And as he's probably still talking and Eating his bread, he's saying, and this wine, you know, in our culture, since the beginning of time when God freed us from Egypt, that we've always remembered what his love for us looked like. And one way we did that is we sacrificed. We sacrificed things at the altar that bled. And the blood had power. It was purpose behind the bloodshed. But let me tell you all this. This is the last sacrifice. There won't be any need to do that anymore because I am the last sacrifice. I will shed my blood for you. And this is what he said in scripture. And those who are to come. So the sacrifice is to be remembered through communion. So I could see him raising that cup and saying to his friend, let us drink together in remembrance of this day. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Lord. I'm going to move quickly with the rest of service, and I'm going to ask that Maya Thompson come up to give us our announcement. Oh, looks like Sanaa and Maya are doing announcements today. Everybody say, hello, Sanaa. Good morning, everyone. We have some amazing things coming up, starting with corporate prayer. We're going to get together and pray together next Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. It's only 30 minutes of your time. We're going to get together and do that. Um, we also have, I don't know how many of you have a physical fitness goal for this year like I do, but uh, we have one fit. Ember is an amazing sh instructor. And woohoo! Thanks, Ember. <laughs> And on the 27th of this month, we will have a virtual 
work out. So if you have about 40 minutes, you can get a good workout in. So let's plan to, to be there. So one finance, instead of this next Tuesday, February 7th, we'll actually um, have a class on March 7th. So it'll be Tuesday, March 7th. And the women's ministry will have an event coming up on the 19th. And it's called a Sister Assist Her event. We will be at the Extension Women's Shelter on February 19th at 6.30 to 8 p.m. It's an hour and a half of your time. Let's get together, ladies, and do this. Um, the Unit Men's Ministry has a whole lot going on. I love it. The Unit Men will begin walking Kennesaw Mountain again next Saturday, February 11th. So y'all getting fine, right? Y'all just working it? <laughs> okay. And then the unit uh, men will also have breakfast together on February 25th. Um, I did want to ask Dwayne. I saw you somewhere. Where you at, Dwayne? Hey, Dwayne. Are there any spots left for the Valentine's? There's two spots left for the Valentine's dinner. So the men are going to actually do this for their wives. And if you will see Dwayne, if you want to go ahead and do something for your honey, that's the right person. Um, One Love Marriage Ministry will be back for part two of the discussion of the best man final chapter. That was amazing. The first one was great. So if you missed it, you can still jump in on part two. And that will be on the 25th. That will be the 25th. So stay tuned for that info. You will have probably seen it on social media but um, and in your emails. And lastly, we mentioned the food distribution yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll be coming back March 4th to do it again. So get prepared. And then we just want to let you all know that on the 19th, we will no longer be live streaming our service. Did I say that right, Dan? on on Facebook Live. And um, lastly, we're just going to extend our worship through giving. So here you can do that through Cash App, Zelle, on our website under the Giving tab, or our preferred method, which is texting GIVE to 678-551-6115. Did I miss anything, y'all? No? Okay. Love you guys. Thank you for worshiping with us today. And we thank you for donating to One Church ATL through our giving. We look forward to seeing you here next Sunday at 10 a.m. in person at our Marietta location or right here on our social media page. We love you and look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Thank you for tuning in to our live One Church ATL broadcast. One Church ATL continues to be actively involved with spreading the gospel and impacting lives in our local community. Because of your continued financial support, we've been able to support our first responders and agencies directly involved with supplying resources to those in need. Our ministry has partnered with food distribution centers to assist with the immediate needs of our community, and we've been able to address needs right here within the body of Christ. Your continued support is appreciated as we spread the gospel of the kingdom through giving. On behalf of One Church ATL, we want to say thank you for giving. We pray your resources continue to be blessed.